Over the span of a few short days in the summer of 2021, concurrent events were happening in our world that were unprecedented. Temperatures in Pakistan were described by scientists as unfit for the human body. Flash floods pounded Moscow. Western Canada recorded more than 700,000 lightning strikes. Later in this same summer, hurricanes once again uprooted property and lives along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and caused New York subways to flood. Air temperatures in the Arctic were recorded at 38 degrees Celsius for the first time in history. Ground temperatures in the Arctic were recorded at 48 degrees Celsius. The alarms that have been ringing for years can no longer be ignored or dismissed as hyperbole. The notion of climate change is not hypothetical. In every corner of our planet, the climate crisis is our new reality. And it is disrupting the delicate web of life on which humans and nature depend. In prior years, we have used World News Day to meet some of the bravest newsmakers of the year and to celebrate the journalists who have brought these profound stories to our lives. On this World News Day, we have chosen to lend our collective voice and the spotlight of this day to feature stories of climate change and voices of the affected. Stories brought to us by journalists and news organizations from across the world who have dedicated their efforts to bring us the truth on what is the single most urgent issue of our lifetime. Stories from across the planet we share. This is World News Day 2021, dispatches from a planet in crisis. My name is Victor Garber, and I'm glad to be with you at this moment in our history. Joining me today is an award-winning journalist and anchor from Global News in Canada. She was featured at our inaugural World News Day in 2018, and we are thrilled she is with us again. Please welcome back to World News Day, my co-host, Farah Nasser. Thank you, Victor. Throughout the global pandemic, we all shared a common hope that when it was over, we would all return to a new normal. Though the pandemic still lingers, a new normal is upon us. It involves polluted air, smoky skies, increased rain, decreased rain, food insecurity, and sweltering heat causing loss of life. Regardless of how our personal politics lean, regardless of which language we speak, regardless of our economic fortunes, the climate crisis will not discriminate. The climate crisis is the greatest health issue of our time. The United Nations recently released a report describing the crisis as code red for humanity. With the stakes so high, misinformation around this issue is not only a breach of trust, it is an assault to our individual and collective well-being. The reporting of issues around climate change has real-world ramifications. Lives are in the balance. Truth in journalism has never been more important, and that's why a day like today matters as never before. World News Day is presented by the Canadian Journalism Foundation in partnership with the World Editors Forum. Representing the Canadian Journalism Foundation, please welcome the Editor-in-Chief of the Globe and Mail, David Walmsley. At the Canadian Journalism Foundation, we believe that as journalism goes, so goes democracy. We believe that fact-based journalism is the vital part of the playbook that will help us all work together to fight the climate crisis. Nurturing and celebrating the trust between fact-based journalism and the people that it serves is what today is all about. The World News Day is a key annual event for the Canadian Journalism Foundation. The work of the Foundation continues year-round through programs that help the public fight misinformation, to monthly talks that focus on journalism's essential role in society, and awards and fellowships that honour the very best in our business and foster excellence in the next generation of journalists. The work of the CJF is ongoing and as critical as it has ever been in its 30-year history. We would like to thank you for joining us on this World News Day. And we would like to acknowledge the many people and organizations that make today's global event possible. To our sponsors, we convey continuing gratitude. Thank you to our steadfast supporter, the Google News Initiative. 
Thank you to our in-kind sponsor, Sishin. And thank you to the Lippo Group for your support of fact-based journalism. Today, newsrooms on six continents are joining us in celebrating World News Day. And more than 100 of the world's most prestigious news organizations are sharing stories and marking the occasion in unique ways. World News Day is more than just a day where we gather. It's a movement. And this movement is nothing without an audience. So thank you for joining us and for your support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce from Singapore, the editor-in-chief of The Straits Times, Warren Fernandez. I'm here in The Straits Times newsroom in Singapore, which is unusually quiet and deserted because of COVID-19 restrictions that we all know about. Now, the scientists were quick to develop a solution, effective vaccines, Yet our response has been slow, hampered by populist politics, global inequalities, and a pandemic of misinformation. This has allowed the virus to spread further, mutate, and compound our problems with new waves of infection. The past months have made plain how difficult it's going to be to tackle that other looming crisis, climate change. The science is clear and getting more so by the day. The extreme weather events we have been witnessing all around the planet are signs of what could lie ahead. Yet here too, politics, inequality, and misinformation make it much harder to forge a consensus on the way forward. And this is where professional newsrooms have a vital role to play by establishing the facts and presenting the arguments and communicating these to our audiences in a clear, credible, and compelling way which is why we are focusing on climate change for this year's World News Day. Global warming is the story of our generation. We will showcase the work of newsrooms all around the world, telling the stories of how climate change is already impacting our communities and how these communities are responding to this critical challenge of our times. Wildfires have been a regular occurrence in the Western United States for years now. So much so that the annual spread of fire seems almost expected. The shocking images of devastation, almost commonplace. But on September 9th, 2020, in the skies over San Francisco, things progressed to a new, even more alarming level. As daylight broke on that fateful day, there was no California blue sky, nor would there be. The locals now refer to September 9th, 2020 as Orange Day. With the story, here's the New Yorker. My name is Andrew, and I live in Oakland. I uh, woke up at around 10, uh, and usually there's a good amount of light coming through my window, and there was no light coming through my window, and I went and opened my front door, and there it was, you know. Yeah, it was like nighttime. It, uh, it was red. It was very red. It was just a huge new statement from nature that we ought to be paying attention. In September of, of 2020, we really had a horrifying coming together of different conditions that amplify wildfires. Very unusual air circulation patterns and dramatic convergence over an area with millions of people. I live in the Mission in San Francisco. I remember waking up that day being extremely confused. Just being afraid, collectively afraid with everyone else. That was like the end of the world. And it was it this was orange glow. It felt like the end of the world. It felt like the end of the world. It felt like the end You know, Mars. For many people, the, the world was just a lot less comforting and hospitable than it had been the day before. September of 2020 was a period of the largest wildfires the state of California has seen in recorded history. On September 9th, there were almost 500,000 acres ablaze in Oregon, and a tremendous amounts of smoke were being released. The quantity of smoke was very, very high, and it was converging on the state. Smoke wasn't right against the ground. It was up several thousand feet in the atmosphere where it was mixing with fog, to create essentially a blanket that the sunlight had to come through. We had decent air quality close to the ground, but we're looking at a world 
with illumination that was coming through this smoke cloud above us. So dense that people noticed as the day September 9th went on that it got darker and darker during the day rather than lighter and lighter. And the reason the cloud is red is kind of like the reason that sunsets are red. White sunlight is all the colors of the rainbow. The light with shorter wavelengths, the, the blues, the greens, don't make it through a dense cloud like that. Only the light with the longest wavelengths, the oranges and the reds, make it through. And that's why the sky seemed like it was this orangey, reddy color. recognizing that it, it was like a signal that was putting a giant exclamation point around how serious and unusual our situation was. The most recent studies indicate that in the last couple of decades, about half of the increase in wildfire activity is a direct result of the climate changes that have already occurred. In the last 30 years or so, climate change has basically doubled the amount of area that we lose in wildfires in a, in a typical year. It seemed to fit with the, the idea of uh, the future being gloomier and this is going to become more ordinary. The reason for this dark sky was these terrible fires that had, that had caused so much damage and loss of life, and, and that every year it's getting worse due to climate change. So. Innovation, new thinking, new investment, new infrastructure. These are the things that will allow us to change the demand for fossil fuel and change the patterns of consumption sufficiently to alter the consequences of that consumption. In Singapore, science and technology are leading to innovations in everything from how we power our communities to how we grow our food. To tell the story of how Singapore is being solarized from the Straits Times, here's Audrey Tan. This is what sustainability in Singapore looks like solar panels on water, and fish farming in the sky. This juxtaposition of two such innovations show how Singapore plans to reduce its carbon footprint and adapt to climate change. This is Tungi Reservoir Floating Solar Farm. With more than 120,000 solar panels, this joint project by National Water Agency PUB and Energy Firm Samcor covers a massive 45 hectares. So the reservoir is the other way to go to solarize Singapore. This is a 60 megawatt project and is about 4% of Singapore's 1.5 gigawatt target. This translates to a carbon emissions offset of 32 kilotons annually, equivalent to removing around 7,000 cars from the road. And the energy from these solar panels will go on to power the production of another scarce resource, especially here in Singapore, water. For PUB, this energy also is able to power all our five water works. So with this project, Singapore will be one of the few in the world to be 100% green in terms of water treatment. You have heard of vertical vegetable farming and community plots on rooftops. But the next frontier for urban farming in Singapore is this. Growing fish not in the sea, but in Apollo Aquaculture's eight-storey facility in Lim Chu Kang. Making a splash in one of these floating ponds are hybrid grouper and coral trout fry. With eight storeys of these ponds, they could potentially yield almost 2,700 tonnes of fish per year. That's six times more than Apollo's Pilot 3 tit fish farm in the area. The way we farm is really uh, you less space because we can control all the, what we are farming. And, and also we find very safe in the sense that we don't need to use any antibiotic and I think with, with this, we can really improve and uh, maximize the, the, the output. Short on space, but not on ideas. By breaking away from the conventional mode, Singapore is scaling new heights in its bid to tackle climate change. Audrey Tan, The Straits Times. The light that will guide us through the climate crisis will be provided by science. 
Relaying this silence and the facts that accompany it to all of us in a timely and responsible way is the duty of every journalist assigned to the issue. Combine the urgency of the crisis with the fact that we live in an era of unprecedented misinformation and the obstacles that face individual journalists and news organizations are greater than ever before. One of the things that we can all do is support journalists and news organizations who are committed to fact-based journalism on this pressing subject. Throughout this broadcast, we will be joined by editors from some of the world's leading news organizations, news leaders who are committed to finding truth so that we can tackle this challenge together. We as journalists have been writing about climate change since the 90s, and now it's time to pause and assess whether our journalism is meeting this moment. Do we have enough resources to reach broad audiences around the world? Do our newsrooms understand that climate change is long past being merely an environmental story? If at the very least we bring our entire newsrooms into our climate coverage, then we do actually have way more resources that we can then leverage to our advantage. Because even if humanity is somehow able to keep our planet to 1.5 Celsius of warming by 2100, that doesn't mean things won't continue to worsen or that extreme weather will go away. We are already at 1.2 C of warming. We have to be certain that even if politicians fail, even if corporations fail, that doesn't mean we don't keep up the pressure to cut emissions now. That's our responsibility as journalists to meet the moment and to succeed. Stories of climate devastation may lead some of us to believe that our planet is past the point of repair. But in the midst of these stories, there is also hope. Hope that if we learn, we can change. Belief that if we change, our planet will respond. That belief is why we're here today. That belief is why I'm here today. Journalism can play a role in this change by finding and highlighting the work of those that can teach and inspire us on matters of climate. In Hong Kong, there is a young person who has taken a leadership role in educating adults on the realities of the crisis and is providing a path as to what we can all do to change our trajectory. Amplifying the voice of this young agent of change, the South China Morning Post. Hi everyone, I am Lance Lau. I'm 11 years old and I am a local climate activist from Hong Kong. I started uh, striking uh, after I heard from Greta Thunberg about the climate emergency. I typically strike on Friday. I speak to people um, that's on the street, walking by, and educate them about what they can do to help stop this problem. Extreme weather, extreme temperatures, these will all hit us harder and hit us more frequently. We have to start acting now before it's too late. If we don't act now, climate change will only worsen. Me and my generation will be the ones most affected. That's why I've been striking to raise awareness about this problem. Now the beach cleanups, I typically do that once a month. I do sometimes beach, sometimes mangrove. Um, so there's this mangrove I was doing today and that's pretty much my backyard, I guess I'd call it. So I feel like I have a bit of a responsibility, I guess, to clean that up. I'm hacking at this ghost net. So if we free the ghost net, that can help a lot of animals from not getting trapped. Now, typically what I pick up there is styrofoam. There's a lot of that, washes in all the time, and it just goes into the bushes, which is really annoying, because the animals all eat it. 
I get a lot of one-time plastics, chip bags, uh, plastic bottles because lots of people go there. They love to either party or they go there to dig for like oysters. Uh, they always leave a lot of trash on site because A, there's no rubbish bin, B, it's more convenient to litter. So that's what they do. Cross stock. Oh my God. Okay. There's still crabs inside. Okay, yeah, lots more. Well, I feel very thankful for everyone who's joined my cleanup, and um, I feel well, pretty happy to be able to um, help the community, I guess. My biggest target, I guess, is for the government, um, the world, to declare climate emergency and start acting. The public can do a lot on a personal level and with more power we can more easily uh, ask the government or any big companies to change because if everyone's educated about climate change they'll start making climate conscious decisions which causes big companies and the government to suit them. We've gotten ourselves into a bit of trouble, but there is still hope if we start acting now. And remember, action has to come before hope. There's hope, but before that, there must be action. True change to our behavior may result from policy change and legislation, but before any of that can happen, the process will most certainly begin with education. And it will especially begin with the education of our youth, or our youth educating us. This past year, the World Editors Forum and the World Association of News Publishers, in association with the National Youth Achievement Award and the Youth Climate Report, created an initiative called the Next Gen Video Challenge. The goal? To tell the story of climate change in an entertaining, original, and accessible fashion. A team of young storytellers from Nanyang Polytechnic have answered the call and have crafted a story through the eyes of a character who may remind us of ourselves. Meet Chris, the master waster. Meet Chris Le Baoqi. He's the most wasteful man on earth. Chris doesn't care about how much greenhouse gases he produces, how much water he wastes, or how much waste he will uh, waste. This is what happens to the earth. Imagine if it was a ball. Every day, it is being subjected to rising temperatures, rising sea levels, and extreme weather events. Heavy traffic produces lots of carbon emissions, which cause global warming. According to Meteorological Service Singapore, the island is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the world, and it's not stopping anytime soon. Climate change has led to many cases of abnormal weather, February 2021 was one of the driest seasons Singapore has ever had since 1869. Then, the country experienced exceptionally heavy rainfall for the next four months, one of the highest in 40 years. Heavy rain has also led to more flash floods. You might be judging Chris right now, but do you do the same things he does? We all have a little bit of Chris in us. Yes, we are also causing climate change. If we keep going at this rate, the earth is becoming more and more fragile, just like this ball. What can we do? Firstly, instead of taking private cars, you can reduce your carbon footprint by taking public transport. This reduces energy consumption and emits less harmful greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. What if you still need a car? Picture this, an electric car and a petrol car. The petrol car consumes a lot more fossil fuels a lot of harmful greenhouse gases are produced when fossil fuels are burnt, making petrol cars much more harmful to the environment than electric ones. Secondly, don't throw that plastic container away. Greenhouse gases are emitted during the production and destruction of plastics. This increases the temperature of the earth. So, find a way to reuse your plastics. The more water you use, the more you might waste. It takes lots of energy to pump, treat and heat water which increases greenhouse gas emissions. There are lots of easy ways to save water. Instead of baths, 
take quick showers, and turn off the tap when you're soaping or when not in use. If Chris can be a better person, then so can you. Speak up about stopping climate change as much as you can. The future is in our hands, literally. Climate change is one of the biggest stories of our time. It is about the environment. It is about how changes affect markets, business, politics, and society. Global warming is affecting how and where business is done, which foods are grown, what technologies are developed, and how we manage our world spaces. Climate change is shaping investment decisions, the future of industry, the landscape of politics and regulation. At Reuters, we aim to shed light on what is happening in the world so that people, governments, and businesses can respond rapidly, intelligently. Each month, Reuters produces hundreds of videos and thousands of pictures and written stories on climate change. We hope that our accurate and unbiased coverage will inform and enlighten the world. To support the urgent message that Alessandra just delivered to us, the team at Reuters has created a sample of the important work they are doing during this climate emergency. Let's watch. Mother Nature is not waiting. The past decade was the hottest on record. If we keep on the current track, we will see desertification, drought, crop failure, and mass movements of humanity not seen before. We have not once been treating this crisis like an actual crisis. Put a value on nature that goes far beyond money. The U.S. officials have warned that reservoir supplies are projected to keep falling. If authorities don't act quickly, it's going to be non-reverse. There's a couple great opportunities going forward. When the floods in West Germany receded, they left behind mud, rubble, and people looking to pick up the pieces of their lives that were altered suddenly and without negotiation. Deutsche Welle provides a portrait of light in the face of tragedy. Aber wir sind am Leben. Es sind so viele Tote. Das ist unglaublich. Die, das, man kann sich jetzt nicht vorstellen, was hier passiert ist. Wir haben das Haus komplett neu renoviert, saniert, aufgestockt. Wir haben alles neu gemacht. Fußbodenheizung, Geflies, Badezimmer, Küche, alles neu. Und vor ein paar Tagen kam die Welle. Wir haben über 24 Stunden in der obersten Etage gesessen, weil die Feuerwehr kam hier hin und hat nur gesagt, seid ihr körperlich unversehrt und ihr müsst gucken, wie ihr klarkommt. Wie soll es mir gehen? Es ist, ja, vielleicht ist das Haus unbewohnbar. Von mir hat um Hilfe gebot, äh, gebeten und äh, bin ich hergefahren, habe ein bisschen eingekauft und äh, ja, so einen kleinen Essenstand aufgebaut mit ein bisschen Trinken, Babynahrung. Das ist wirklich 
Also eine Katastrophe kann man da auf jeden Fall reden, also Kriegszustand in meinen Augen. Ich habe auch äh, unten direkt am Wasser eine Familie gehabt, die, die konnten gar nicht aus dem Haus raus. Also den habe ich über den Balkon oder über das Dach vom, äh, von der Garage äh, ja, die Verpflegung hochgegeben. Der Keller wurde jetzt gestern ausgepumpt, wird aber alles in Eigenregie organisiert. Also von staatlicher Seite kommt leider noch gar nichts. Aber die Ober ist schlimmer betroffen und das ist wichtiger, dass denen geholfen wird. Aber wenn Sie jetzt hier so durchs Dorf gehen, Sie sehen, hier wird schon aufgeräumt, alles freiwillige Helfer. Alle Leute, die irgendwas jetzt gebrauchen können, weil sie irgendwas verloren haben, nicht schlafen können oder nur Klamotten brauchen, die können hier alle hinkommen und sich das abholen. Es wurde jetzt auch gestoppt mit den Spenden, weil immer weiter kam, weil es einfach zu viel wurde. Aber die Bereitschaft ist schon sehr groß. Dass noch jemand da ist, den man ansprechen kann von der Stadt. Selbst wenn es immer das Gleiche ist, was derjenige sagen muss. Aber das zumindest auch von der Seite ein bisschen. Das Gefühl für die Menschen kommt, die kümmern sich. Wir wissen nicht genau, kommen wir in unser Haus noch mal rein? Kommen wir überhaupt noch mal rein? Kann man das überhaupt noch mal benutzen? Kann man das noch bewohnen? Oder ist das für alle Zeiten verschwunden? Ne? When our world entered lockdown in 2020 and many of our industries were paused, There were positive environmental signs that shone through the uncertainty, signs that exemplified our planet's resilience. Mere weeks after lockdown, air pollution in China's industrial cities decreased by 40 percent. Canals in Italy that once housed pollution from cruise ships were once again blue. And with the absence of industrial discharge and detergents, fish and dolphins and swans returned to the waterways that they've avoided for decades. While we were all indoors, wildlife once again took claim to wide open spaces. Signs of hope. Examples of how if we change our behavior, the positive impacts on our Earth can be tangible and they can be immediate. With a deeper dive into the impact that COVID-19 had on carbon emissions and with the help of a young mind we've all become familiar with, we welcome this piece from the BBC. The pandemic has led to a global shutdown. Air travel has dramatically reduced. Factories are closed. And roads and motorways are empty. In one of the most profound changes to human society and living memory. The impact on the planet itself is being calculated. Hello. Hi, how are you? Fine, and you? I'm good. Uh, I'm all good here. Dr. Jenny Stavraku uses satellite data to measure levels of nitrogen oxide in the atmosphere, created by burning fossil fuels and a strong indicator of levels of carbon dioxide. Did you see a drop in the emissions when the coronavirus first hit? Uh, let me show you uh, a map. So the coronavirus crisis started in China and from 23rd of January we see a big decrease of nitrogen dioxide levels more than 50 percent in some places. Have you ever seen changes this drastic before? Such a change was completely unprecedented. We had to check that the data was correct. Dr. Stavraku's data shows that as industrialized nations shut down, emissions dropped substantially. In parts of the USA, by up to 40%. But over the next few months, the data was less encouraging. So from January, since the beginning of the lockdowns up to April, on the global scale, there is a decrease of about 17% in the CO2 emissions over this period. It's 17% lower than in the previous year. Uh, when was the last time we were down at, at those kinds of emissions levels? With what we have now, we are back in 2006 levels. So that, uh, that really shows the, the scope of the challenge that we are facing when we shut down our societies completely. We only go back like 14 years to 2006. 
-hmm. So yeah, it's really shocking. In 2020, the total emissions were around 7% lower than in 2019. A UN report found that we need to drop on average 7.6% year on year for the next nine years to be on track to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. The climate crisis is perhaps the most difficult, most complex issue that humanity has ever faced. And the lockdown has really showed us the scale of the problem we are facing and that the time for small steps is long gone. The global climate crisis is the emergency of our times. Amid all the fear and sadness of the COVID pandemic, it remains the most overwhelming long-term threat to our planet and to the health and security of us all. That is why The Guardian is committed to reporting on the climate emergency, raising the alarm and investigating both the crisis and the possible solutions. The Guardian's climate reporting is rooted in science and grounded in human stories. It explores how so many of the world's other problems, public health, migration, food security, land conflict, equality, gender, race, intersect with the environmental catastrophe. And this is a challenge bigger than any individual, any organisation or any single government. If we all work together, there is still a path forward that avoids the worst outcomes. The worldwide response to COVID-19 has demonstrated that there can be collective global action and that humans are capable of changing very quickly when the collective moment demands it. As news organisations, we are uniquely positioned and have a profound responsibility to meet this challenge, to chronicle these events in all their shock and immediacy, to connect our audiences to the events in a human way, to treat the climate crisis like the emergency it is. We have to hold all governments, the powerful and the polluters, accountable and to empower people to demand action. This year could be the world's last chance to make a meaningful difference. Canaries are more sensitive to dangerous gases than we humans are. And that's why, in less advanced times, coal miners would often bring canaries with them into their shafts. Once underground, if the canary suffered, the human would know that conditions were unsafe and then people would leave the mine and flee to safety. Wildlife continues to be a barometer for the wellness of our Earth. In the spirit of us learning about our conditions through this prism, our next story takes us to the continent of Antarctica, we're going to learn about the changing climate through the story of two species of penguins. From The Guardian, reporting from the edge of the earth, global environment editor of The Guardian, Jonathan Watts. I'm in Antarctica to explore a tale of two penguins. One, the native chin strap, which has evolved for this climate and this climate only. The other, the Gen 2, an arrival that's moving in in higher and higher numbers. I'm joining a group of scientists to examine human impacts on this most remote area of the world. Why should anyone care about the chinstrap penguin? Well, this cute little animal is a warning to the rest of us that immense changes are taking place. And if they can't survive, then who can? Gen 2s are really expanding all over the Antarctic Peninsula region. They're a penguin that you find usually further north. They're up in the Falklands and Argentina and other places like that. But as the climate is changing down here, we're seeing Gen 2 populations expand all over the place. The chinstrap penguin, it's a specialist. It's a sign of just how biodiverse the world can be. It's the one that's struggling. The numbers are down an enormous amount. On the other hand, the Gen 2 penguin, which is a generalist, which can survive in much warmer conditions, that can eat just about any kind of food. They're thriving, they're moving in where the chin straps have moved out or declined. One scientist compared the Gen 2 to a pigeon. 
It's the bird that can survive anywhere. What the scientists are concerned about is that we are moving towards a world where you have more of these generalists, but far less variety. So there are climate winners and climate losers. And they say this is like the canary in the coal mine. A penguin in the Antarctic is telling us of the dramatic changes that are taking place over a far wider area. It's only 200 years since a human being even set eyes on the Antarctic. For the first 100 years, the Antarctic's wildlife was decimated. Many whales were hunted almost to extinction. Seals and penguins were slaughtered for their oils. And there was competition for the resources of the Antarctic. But in the last 50 or 60 years, there have been regulations, there have been international agreements, there have been measures to protect what's left, and these have worked. That sounds like a lot more than were there previously. I think the lesson for me from the Antarctic is a positive one, which is that when humanity comes together, we can achieve incredible things and we can overcome what we have done wrong in the past. In addition to recognizing the work of the journalists who use words to inform and educate us, World News Day would also like to recognize the inspiring work of those who capture the images that define our times. Images that tell us a story that words simply cannot. We, of course, are referring to the photojournalists, visual storytellers, who routinely go to the places where danger resides, those who go where waters are rising, those who travel to the fires. The images we are about to see were captured through the lenses of photojournalists with the Reuters News Agency, providing the soundtrack to some of the most stunning images of the past year is an artist who is not only a national treasure in her home country of Canada, but an international superstar who has performed with the most prestigious symphonies in some of the most revered concert halls in the world. Lending her voice and performing a song written specifically for today, please welcome to World News Day, Misha Bruger gossman Lee.
Our next story takes us to South Africa, a place where 70 percent of the country's energy requirements are met by coal, an energy supply that's killing those who harvest it, an energy supply that's threatening those it's intended to serve. As the world moves away from coal, South Africa faces the challenge of finding new and better ways to provide power to its people and to keep them safe. The Thomson Reuters Foundation did a deep dive on the complex issue of powering South Africa, the economic and environmental challenges, and the human toll that coal can take. This series was co-produced with KCET, a content channel of the Public Media Group of Southern California. For a country rich in resources like South Africa, the answer to the energy dilemma may just be blown in the wind. Here's a slice of the documentary, South Africa's battle between coal and climate. Most of the people that work here, they used to work at mines before. So when the mine decides to shut down, they have nothing to do but to go down there and dig for themselves. We find that coal is our natural resources. It's the only thing that can generate electricity at this point in time. The owner of the mines are here to get profit. They don't care what's going on with the communities. Any activity by human beings will somehow, you know, like a, uh, change the ecosystem that we operate in. Where the guys work, it's way, way, way too far. I don't think we can... About 1.5 kilometer. Yes, South Africa does have mountains of coal. But we also have mountains of asbestos. But we decide to leave asbestos in the ground where it belongs. Where the coal mines and the power stations are located is amongst one of the most polluted areas on Earth. The very, very large cost to coal mining, You're basically signing death warrants for people who live there. The people here are working just to put food on the table. Very, very tough to survive. If we say we are no longer going to generate uh, coal through coal fired power stations, and we are going to solars and so on and so on. Who, how many people are going to be employed in those uh, initiatives? If you compare per unit of electricity produced, both in the operating and in the construction phase, the number of jobs in the renewable uh, area is higher. There's the old coal fields of Mpumalanga province, where there is an entire coal mining industry in decline. But the big opportunity is that these towns have got roads and schools and clinics and housing and skills. They've got welders, electricians, builders, all looking for jobs. And the most important thing that they've got is a grid connection. This makes them an incredibly good opportunity to become renewable energy development zones of the future. What can we do as individuals to protect our environment? What can we do to make our voices heard? And if our voices are raised, 
will it matter? The next story is about a community with modest means who were very concerned about what a proposed mine would do to the small island where they work, live, and raise their families. It's a story that will tell you, yes, sometimes David can take on Goliath, and sometimes David will win. We now head to the pristine Solomon Islands in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. Take a look at this piece from The Guardian, Australia. Wagina is the only land for my people. Wagina people now, 95% are doing seaweed farming. And that's the main economy or way to get money in Wagina. They can buy school fees, they can build houses. There are lots of things that they can own by seaweed farming. We see these two, mining and uh, uh, logging, not devil as development. They will come and destroy the place. We already had a very vibrant economic, sustainable economic activity going on in the place. The danger was, what would the mining, if, if mining does take place, what would it do to the seas around it? around the area where we do seaweed farming, what sort of damage will it cause? So that's how it all began. We're no longer landowners. We have no blocks here, no nothing. It, be, it is all crown land. Because we didn't own the land. And hence the reason we were not consulted. So these guys, they've got a mining license, so they came. They came basically saying, well, we've got a license, guys. Tough luck. One day they decided to come without our knowledge and they come landed at the Crocodile Passage. Ladies, children and all that, and went and challenged where they were going to land and land the machinery. We went about 70 people from the village and we sent them off back. So we couldn't really argue this case under land ownership because we have no land ownership. And we decided the best place to approach this is via the environmental impact and how it's going to impact our people. Particularly when there's already a very vibrant economic activity taking place in this place, which is seaweed farming and export. The board met and decided that our arguments the things we put together were convincing that the mining couldn't go ahead without, without us uh, being consulted properly. That mining, if, if we are not very careful with that mining, then it will have very big impact. And that will be a very dangerous. We don't have any land in any parts of the country. This is our land. This is where we live. I don't have any land in, elsewhere to accommodate my kids here. Wagina is the only land. And when it got damaged, then what else? What will be done? Any biologist will tell us that in its simplest form, water plus air equals the formula for life. As we will learn, when the makeup of that water is altered, the very nature of our formula for life is also fundamentally altered. Our ecosystem is disrupted. Our food supply is threatened. Our wildlife put in peril. 
In Canada, climate change is sucking the oxygen out of the lakes. From the prairies of Saskatchewan, here is a piece from Bonnie Allen for CBC News' The National. In southern Saskatchewan, this is one of eight lakes that University of Regina researchers test and sample every two weeks. So you can see the oxygen's going to drop as you go down. Testing that's been done for 28 years. Watching what happens to lakes over time. And the lakes are changing. Data from here and similar research in Ontario helped scientists analyze nearly 400 lakes in the northern hemisphere. Their findings, published in Nature Journal, show oxygen levels have fallen over four decades by about 5% at the surface and 19% in deep waters. So in the surface, you're losing oxygen because it's getting warmer. And in the bottom, you're losing oxygen both because it's getting warmer, but also because the lakes are getting greener through time. Greener because of an oversupply of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, often fueled by human sewage and farm fertilizer seeping into the lake. At its worst, it breeds toxic blooms of algae. In the Muskoka, Ontario region, volunteers are monitoring the algae. With climate change and the more hot, dry weather, lakes that never had a blue-green algae bloom in the past, they could experience them now. All right, there we go. Jason Mattity is a professional angler who captured this video of the potentially toxic blooms. It's just like... I, I can't even fish here because it's thick. And I certainly wouldn't eat the fish out of there, and a lot of the older people say that they wouldn't do that as well. On Papikasis First Nation, Michelle Brass teaches traditional ways of hunting and gathering food. Decreasing oxygen in the lakes means there's less oxygen for fish to breathe. It really does damage the local food system that Indigenous peoples rely upon. Experts say it's possible to remedy the problem, but only if we control land use around lakes and slow climate change. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Pasqua Lake, Saskatchewan. Even deserts need rain. What happens if that rain stops? In Iraq, climate change is posing a threat to not only the animals that have thrived there for years, but to the way of life of the Bedouins, the nomadic people that have shepherded these creatures for generations. With this powerful story from Al Jazeera English, here's Simona Fulton. Spring has arrived in the deserts of Iraq's southern Muthanna province. April is a time when the sandy soil should turn into grazing land to allow livestock to gain weight ahead of the scorching summer heat. Instead, camels must make do with scattered patches of scruffy grass. Climate change is eroding the sustenance of these animals, spelling an existential crisis for the nomadic tribes who depend on them. There is no rain and the land is dry. The grass has turned into desert. We have to sell some animals to buy food for the rest. This is what life has become. During our visit, clouds gathered in what some hoped would be the first proper downpour this year, but only a few drops trickled from the sky, barely enough to wet the ground. There has been very little precipitation this year, and when it does rain, it's only for a few minutes, which is not enough to transform this desert into pastures for the livestock to feed on. The wells that once sustained animals and humans alike have long run dry, Rather than migrating in sync with Mother Nature, the Bedouins buy water and truck it from a nearby village. But how much longer can they keep going before they're forced to abandon this increasingly difficult way of life? Rahi Hamis cannot imagine doing anything else. He has no education, no other source of income. I never thought about leaving this life and I never will until my animals leave me. Step by step the animals will disappear. His friend Saran Dahi left the desert a long time ago. Today he has come back to visit from a nearby town. There's no future here. They only know how to herd animals. There's no education. There's no future for the Bedouins. Maybe in the end there won't be any left. Out of Saran's nine siblings, only one still lives a nomadic life. The rest have swapped tents for brick and mortar dwellings in the desert hamlet of Al Busea. Here, Saran found work in the local water department. I prefer the desert, but the kids have gotten used to the town, air conditioners, and phones. They go to school. 
Saran's five children only know Bedouin traditions from stories passed down from their grandfather, tales about humans living in harmony with nature, about large animal herds moving freely across borders and feeding on seemingly endless green pastures. It's a way of life that could soon be just a memory. Simona Foltin, Al Jazeera, in Iraq's Muthana province. Jorge Ramos is a revered journalist who has been christened the Walter Cronkite of Latin America. Over the course of his distinguished career, Mr. Ramos has covered five wars. Now in his fifth decade of reporting, Mr. Ramos knows we are all now in a battle of our lifetime. He's using his platform to arm his viewers with the weapon of truth. From Univision's flagship show, here's the story about those who are forced to flee the places they have known their whole lives. People in search of employment, people in search of food and water, and people just looking to survive. From Real America with Jorge Ramos, here's a clip from its piece, Refugees of the Sun. Over the past two years, Honduras has become ground zero for Central America's migrant caravans. The long journey to the United States often starts here. Some have made it as far as the U.S. border. Others got turned back in Guatemala or Mexico. For a while, the caravan stopped altogether. Trump closed the U.S. border to asylum seekers, and Central America closed its borders to prevent the spread of coronavirus. But that temporary pause did nothing to fix the root causes of immigration. Instead, the pandemic has made the situation even worse. Now, a U.S. federal court has shot down Trump's third country asylum transit ban. Migrants are on the move once again. And it might not be for all the reasons that you expect. History leaves clues. By embracing truths from our past, we can gain valuable insight into how to live in greater harmony with our planet. Some of our leaders are seeking the institutional knowledge that can be found in our indigenous communities. Insights and practices from those who were the original keepers of this land. Wisdom is available if we are open to listening. With this story about a unique conservation partnership between the indigenous leadership group and the federal government, we turn to a news organization whose reporting has helped drive the national discussion on energy and climate change. The National Observer made history as the first all-digital Canadian publication to win a National Newspaper Award and Michener Award citation. Their reporting shines a light on the vital importance of guardian programs in Canada's conservation efforts. We thank the Indigenous Leadership Initiative for providing this snapshot. The guardianship program is a huge step for us because it's about preserving the land and preserving culture and preserving language. It's an essential thing to our community. A guardian acts as the eyes and ears in each respective territory. They ensure that everybody's following all the rules and regulations that are placed in all the gui laws, our laws. We go out and monitor tourist activities, industry activities, fisheries commercial and sporty. We also do environmental monitoring. A huge aspect of it is healing and getting back in touch with your indigenous self. If there's healthy people that are happy and strong in their culture, and if they receive that from being on the land, then it's a huge investment. You're investing in a better society and a better tomorrow. In 1973, I paddled on my own all the way down this Kangwai. All my life I always heard it was a very strong spiritual place. There was so much brush and debris and everything all over when I got there. It was just totally overgrown. So I took it upon myself to start clearing the village, just trying to show the ancestors that somebody cared. Our land is uh, very important to us. We live on it, we breathe it, we work on it. It gives us life. Without it, we don't have an identity. 
best part of being a guardian is being out on the land where your ancestors have lived for many centuries and just to get reconnect with Mother Nature and how your people lived off the land. There's a gap between the youth and the elders. By starting this program, you know, it's trying to bridge that gap, trying to create that spark to carry on the knowledge. We are sustaining our traditional territory not only for us, but for the whole world. Our ecosystem is so pure, we have so many trees, that we are cleaning up a lot of pollution. It means that we are here protecting Mother Earth in order for the rest of the world to live on her. Our next guest is a pioneer of digital media and has spent his life creating platforms to educate, inform, and inspire as many of us as possible. He's currently the Vice President of News at Google. Under his purview, Google has created programs to create an open and healthy ecosystem for quality journalism. The Google News Initiative provides opportunity and fosters excellence in newsrooms across the globe. He is a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy. Please welcome to World News Day, Richard Gingras. As global temperatures rise, as the frequency of catastrophic climate events increases, at Google we also see a dramatic rise in our society's interest and in its concern as expressed through Google searches. Searches on the impact of climate change, on the rise of sea levels, on heat waves and wildfires, on what can I do about climate change are all at an all-time high. People are searching for answers. They're searching to understand their level of risk. Where is that wildfire in relation to me? They're searching for an understanding of their futures and their children's futures. We strive to show them the most relevant and authoritative information the internet can provide. Resources on what to do from NGOs and public health agencies. News organizations reporting on governmental action or the lack thereof. Analysis of massive wildfires from forestry experts on YouTube. Information about the sources behind the search results to help our users know they're reading trustworthy information. We surfaced fact checks relating to the phrase climate change 80 million times just in the last two weeks. But what more can we do? Particularly given the sharp differences in opinion and the amount of misinformation we're confronted with. What can we do to help citizens of the world understand these complex issues? All of our citizens. The Reuters Institute tells us only a single digit percentage of daily media consumption is online news. If only a small fraction of our society is consuming news, how can we be satisfied that we're doing all we can to inform our citizens of the inordinate challenge of climate change? Can we enable journalistic efforts through collaboration across many newsrooms to create far greater benefit to the communities they serve? In North America, the Google News Initiative will partner with the local media association to create the Covering Climate Collaborative with 22 newsrooms. The collaborative will be a story sharing initiative to generate environmental coverage, to amplify the reach of that coverage, and to monetize those efforts through local and national sponsorships to ensure ongoing sustainability. Can we find ways to convey climate change and its impact outside of traditional news coverage? It will not be enough to create more quality news coverage if that journalistic knowledge isn't seen and consumed. Might we consider other models that reach users who are not daily news consumers, that integrate the impact of climate change within the background media of our lives? For example, most of us check weather reports every day. It might not be of great journalistic import, but it is information we need and rely on. Can we expand the weather report to include more information about climate change? Can it convey how weather patterns have changed over time? How cl climate weather events are damaging our infrastructure, are upsetting our water and food resources? Toward this end, Google has expanded its Common Knowledge Project to gather and disseminate climate change data, including global analysis from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in Geneva 
thus enabling journalists to convey the challenges that will likely impact their communities. Here, the data shows a 10 degree centigrade increase in temperatures in Kern County, California by 2050. There's an old maxim, we can only fix what we measure. Can we at Google, together with the journalistic community, rethink how we give our citizens the information they need to be informed citizens about all matters, including climate change, and thus guide our leaders toward the solutions our societies need? We never think it can happen to us. We never think it can happen to our neighbors. We never think it can happen in our own backyard. Sometimes in the cycle of news, a story will crest, dominate, and soon fade away, only to be replaced by a new story. Though the spotlight of coverage may dim for the people directly involved in these stories, the narrative doesn't fade. The narrative never fades. On June 29th, 2021, the village of Lytton, British Columbia, a place that is accustomed to warm summers, recorded the hottest temperature in their history, 49 degrees Celsius. The next day, in a matter of just a few harrowing minutes, the fortunes of the village and its citizens changed forever. Our next story comes from Farah's colleagues at Global News. It is about the events of June 30th, 2021, the last day of Lytton, BC. The Colleen forensics teams have arrived to enter that community today and to begin the heartbreaking task of searching for victims from a fire that ravaged this community. It has been just too dangerous, too toxic for anyone to enter the village of Lytton until now. At least two people are known to have died, but there are several more people still unaccounted for. Residents had mere moments to escape. The village's mayor and evacuee himself tells Global News it was just 15 minutes from the moment he first smelled the smoke until he watched fire incinerate his community. It was um, stunning how quick, you know, we had gone from no fires to just fully engulfed. It wasn't like it went home to home, it was everywhere. It brings tears to my eyes. Um, you know, also the concern for the people that were in those buildings. And, you know, and the fact that we don't know if they all got out alive, that's very, very hard to, to um, you know, to, uh, to, to take. The Lytton fire is still growing north of the community. Residents of another 100 homes have been forced to evacuate. Evacuation orders are in effect in other parts of the province as well. An out-of-control fire south of Kamloops has grown to 31,000 hectares, also threatening homes. The Skichestin Indian Band issued an evacuation order for two reserves on Friday night, and nearly 700 properties remain under evacuation order around Decca Lake, near the community of 100 Mile House. The district fire chief says around 100 firefighters from other parts of the province are expected to lend a hand as the situation gets worse. 1,500 kilometers to the south of Lytton, fires also raged. The Dixie Fire became the second largest wildfire in U.S. history. In the path of the flames, another 1,000 people lost their homes and another town was lost. Proof that the climate crisis knows no borders. With the shocking story of Greenville, California, the Sacramento Bee. fire came through about 4.30 uh, last night, uh, pushed by about a 30 mile an hour wind from the north end to the south end. The course of fire was on the north end of Greenville and it just pushed the uh, flames right through the town. A uh, couple of people I've talked to were, were there last night and they said it was just like a, a huge tornado just went through the town. Yeah, it burnt that town down in about 25 minutes. I lived five miles out, but uh, we did all our shopping there in Greenville. And we know I know all the people. It's a small community, 3,000 people. We were camping. The fire started on the 14th. 
we were camping on the on the 15th down at uh, down the canyon, Feather River Canyon, down in uh, Caribou. We were ran out of there because a fire was coming up the canyon. We went to or moved to Antelope Lake. Was there for three days. Got moved out of there. We went back to the house. Was there for four hours. Got moved out of our house there on Pioneer Road. Moved over to my brother's house over on North Valley Road. And then they evacuated us out of there, and this is where we've been. We've been moved five times. There's a saying that people use in every city, in every town, in every state, territory, province, and country in the world. If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. As the voices we have heard today would suggest, we no longer have five minutes to wait. As a global population, we need to act now. And to act in a meaningful way, we need to continue to educate ourselves. We educate ourselves by seeking facts. Facts can inform us. Facts can guide our policies. Facts can save us. Facts will save us. You can help. By supporting truth in journalism, you can help shape the future of our planet. Together, we can shape the future of the home we share. I'm Victor Garber, and on behalf of myself and Farah Nasser, thank you for joining us on World News Day.